Hello, and welcome to the University of South Australia's Jean Monnet Lectures. I'm Anthony Elliott. At the Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence and Network, we're dedicated to the development of education, research and outreach programs aimed at promoting a deeper understanding of European Union integration, and especially of EU-Australia relations. The Centre of Excellence is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Commission and the University of South Australia. This lecture focuses centrally on the theme of life on the move in a globalising world. And until only recently, with the outbreak of the COVID-19 global pandemic, women and men had arguably been moving further, faster and more frequently than at any time previously in human history. From automobility to aeromobility, and from communicative mobility through to virtual mobility, the 21st century world of endless instant travel, transport and tourism seemed limitless. But not so today after the arrival of COVID-19. Many critics had already been troubled for the future of cities about the promises of new technologies. We've seen a whole raft of new technologies from the arrival of artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, accelerating automation, big data, machine learning, deep learning and the internet of things raise various promises and lures for the future of advanced cities. But the question had been raised, were these new technologies really apt to provide new environments suitable for sustainable living in the 21st century. Since the arrival of COVID-19, those questions now have only been ramified further. The late German social theorist Walter Benjamin wrote that to lose one's way in a city really requires some schooling. Well, in this particular lecture, that schooling is to be delivered by Marlene Freudendahl Peterson. Marlene Freudendahl Peterson is Professor in Urban Planning at Aalborg University in Denmark, where she works at the intersections of sociology, geography, urban planning, and the sociology of technology. With Sven Kesselring, Professor Freudendahl Peterson is the International Cosmobilities Network founder and co-editor of the journal Applied Mobilities, as well as the book series Networked Urban Mobilities. The title of Professor Freudendahl Peterson's lecture is Smart Cities and Automated Mobilities, or Sustainable Mobilities and Smart Urbanism. Today I'm going to talk to you about smart cities and automated mobilities, or maybe sustainable mobilities and smart urbanism. As you probably guessed from the title, this is a lecture where I'm going to try to discuss what it is that we actually want to do with our cities in the future. The starting point for the research I'm doing is a transdisciplinary starting point. Um, I am specifically interested in the everyday life perspective. Um, I'm interested in the everyday life perspective in relations to technology, in the technologies of mobilities that we use, um, the planning of the city and life, um, the environment, the impact we have, and the communities that we are part of. Um, as you can see from the two pictures on the side, it is a way of showing that what I do with the everyday life perspective is that I don't look at the city from an overall bird's perspective, but I go down on street level and um, investigate what goes on uh, in everyday life when we are doing different kinds of mobilities, uh, what that means for the city, what it means for planning. I think it is always very important when we talk about everyday life to say that for me, everyday life is not about what goes on inside the apartments uh, or houses, 
uh, everyday life is the full life we're living um, and it also contains work life and a lot of other things. Um, what is in everyday life is the whole organization of all the ideas, the plans, the dreams, the wishes we have. And this is why it's actually really important to understand everyday life because that which goes on there moves with us everywhere we go. And that also go for planners and politicians and researchers, um, that the, the way of understanding, the way of experiencing everyday life is actually part of what we bring with us. Um, one of the things that I often have to do, and I'm not sure I need to do it in, in, uh, in this lecture, but I'm going to do it anyways, is basically to come up with this disclaimer. Because when I'm talking about mobilities and I'm talking about cities, somehow the car is always part of it. Because if we want to talk about sustainable mobility, it is not a secret that one of the biggest uh, problems we're facing is actually to handle the pollution from the private car. But what I want to say with this disclaimer is the problem is not the technology. Uh, the problem is the unintended consequences of the technology. Uh, the car is a great invention. Uh, it has brought about a lot of really good things for modern society, but it also brought uh, about a lot of problems that we are uh, trying to handle. One of the ways to um, handle this is basically based on this techno-optimism, uh, where automated driving is definitely one of these that are in front of this. Uh, I think it is always really interesting to see how we try to, or not we, but car companies um, are trying to sell the idea of what automated driving is going to do. There is the idea that it's going to create more sustainability based on um, the efficiency and the minimalizing of um, cues and um, cars holding still. Um, making a lot of pollution. Uh, and then there is this selling the positive thing about automated driving that suddenly provides a whole new space, private space uh, of time where we can use our time for whatever we want to do. Uh, in a modern society, um, time is one of the most valuable resources we have. And this is basically what they're very much um, producing a picture of this is what we get. We get more time to work, to cuddle with our partner, to sleep, um, have meetings, have a party. One of the favorite pictures, or actually my favorite picture on this, is this picture in the one corner with the young teenage girl and the child in the back and the dog. And I guess what they're trying to say is with these automated cars, um, you can put your kids into the car and get them to school and you can go on doing whatever chores you have to do or go to work. Um, one of the things I find really interesting about this is that what is the conception of future lives, the idea about how future lives is, because I basically have a quite strong belief that is that also in the future, parents actually like to hand their kids off to kindergarten. Uh, they don't want to say goodbye by putting them into a car. Uh, they'd rather go to the kindergarten and leave the kids in the capable hands of uh, that grown-up. They leave to take care of their precious one um, while they're working. So there is also some of the stories that are told within automated driving that are has no connection to all the things that are actually surrounding our lives and the values and the emotional parts of why we actually organize our life the way we do. But I'm kind of going to come more back to this, but this is just to, to start out this with this lecture with this techno optimism and the pictures that we are trying to create or they're trying to create about what kind of future this might bring. One of the other things I'm showing you here is pictures from a Toyota movie about, um, um, automation in the city. It's a long movie. It's with all sorts of different modes of mobility. Um, you can see on one of the pictures that's the sensors that makes all this automation possible. 
I would say there is very little moving your uh, own body in this movie. Uh, it makes me think of um, Wally. I don't know if any of you ever saw that cartoon, but this moving around on a daily basis uh, without moving your body is uh, normally not uh, a good idea. Um, but what I also like about this movie or dislike maybe is the more correct thing to say is the total emptiness that is um, shown on these pictures. Um, because this is the kind of city that is imagined, the, um, the kind of city where there is very few cars on the street, there is very ordered and clean environments where everything is ordered in systems and it looks clean and efficient. And if you then go to um, a normal street, or I don't know what normal is, if you go to a street in a city like Copenhagen, for instance, it's a little bit more messy. <coughs> <coughs> this is a picture from one of the neighborhood streets in Copenhagen. Um, and what this picture shows is basically how city life with all different modes of mobilities, people with different errands going different places, how they're using the streetscape. Uh, there is also many more people on this picture as there would be uh, on a normal commuting day. And even with an idea of, um, of automation as a way of making traffic more efficient, I, my guess would be that we probably, we need to redo the whole way society is organized so nobody is, is meeting to work at the same time or going to school at the same time or going to kindergarten at the same time if we want to have uh, that ordered uh, and empty spaces as shown in the pictures on automated cities. But the other question is, is that actually the kind of cities that we're interested in having? Um, one of the reasons why um, automation today and the car is one of these things that takes up so much space in these discussions is basically because of the strong role transport had in urban planning and especially car transport. The modernistic planning idea moved forward by Le Corbusier and his involvement in the CM planning doctrine and the Athens Charter was basically about creating these clear spaces for living and moving and doing things as efficiently as possible. It was based on an idea of flow and efficiency as that would lead to better and happier life. It was an utopia that was created at a time where um, a lot of cities had poor infrastructure and a lot of cities was ruined after the war. Um, so it was an idea of how to actually clean that up and have efficiency and have growth uh, and have things moving um, and working without a lot of obstacles. But this urban planning with this primary objective of economic growth, that's been dominant in the last and the current century. And urban planning has centered on infrastructure systems dominated by an auto logic, the car in center. And the auto logic is the internal growth logic um, of planning systems and policies, which primarily focus on the accessibility and the efficiency of the private car. This is how many cities around the world are still being planned and still being thought about. Um, even in a city like Copenhagen, where I'm going to come back with an example from Copenhagen a little bit later, more examples from Copenhagen a little bit later, it is still, there is still an, an internal logic in the planning system which provides the biggest amount of space uh, and advantages and also the most money to the car system. And these modern planning ideals we have, they're still technocratic with this ideal of flow and zero friction. Um, this dominating neoliberal concept of an economy based on global flows of trade and workforce has resulted in an unchallenged principle of seamless mobility as the pathway for efficient organizations of cities. So 
this is basically an idea that is still floating through the political systems, planning systems, that it's all about efficiency. If you look at the way uh, environmental impact analysis are done, um, they can easily come out with the result that it's much better to create or build a new road uh, or a new tunnel or a new bridge because if that bridge or tunnel or road is built, um, it means that there will not be that many cars on the road. Uh, that means that people, instead of holding in a queue, they will work and they will earn money and they will um, pay taxes um, and the company will make more products and uh, pay more taxes. And also, at the same time, it means that there will be less pollution because people are not uh, holding in a queue and um, and the car is not polluting that much. What is always interesting about this way of thinking about the efficiency and seamless mobility um, is that it is never actually really in these models considered that the time people spend in mobilities is time taken away from their everyday life. So building a new road so people can get to work more quickly doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to work more. Uh, it could also mean that they would actually be more together with their families instead of spending that much time on traffic. This is some of these discussions that are difficult to have because this system of planning with the car in center as something that is creating urban growth or economic growth um, is so firmly uh, integrated in the way we think about planning. And basically, you could say what I'm trying to say with this lecture is in this tradition, the question on why and for what often seems to be missing. What is it actually we want? What is it that we get with a new uh, road uh, or new tunnel or a new bridge? Uh, how do we actually imagine that our, um, that our cities should look in the future? Um, or the the uh, rural areas between the cities. Um, this is some of these things that I will use this um, this lecture to talk about how we could actually also imagine some of these things in a different way. The car is the dominant technology in cities and it's more than just a mode of transport, a technical device or an artifact which one can use for the purpose of social action. The car is an essential part of modern way of life. It is difficult to imagine uh, not having the right to have the car to facilitate uh, your movement. A um, hundred years or so after the birth of the automobility, the experience of driving is sinking into our technological unconsciousness and producing a phenomenology that we increasingly take for granted. In so many areas of um, planning and policy, the, the car as a right that we have, as a fundamental human right, um, is there in a way that we don't even reflect on the fact that it, it could actually be different. I'm not saying that we should get rid of all cars. This is definitely not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying that, that we actually need to take seriously the things that the car also bring with uh, in relation to the way we can organize our city. Um, because it has consequences for the cities with all the cars. For most cities, this auto logic resulted in an optimization of the automobile system that intensified and has accelerated climate change, the standstill in urban traffic, and the ongoing destruction of public places. There is um, a very interesting project that was going on at the London School of Economics. They still have a website, so you can still go in there and look at the project. It was called The Endless City. What they did in this project was they um, went around to a lot of big cities in the world and they talked to the planners, the practitioners um, and the researchers in those cities and, and basically discussed what created this city, what was the background, the ideas of how this city was created. One of the things that comes out in one of these books is that it it's been said that it may well be that cities are more often the product of unintended consequences than of anything else. This exact quote is taken from the 
one of the books, The Endless City, that is about where they're talking about traffic and the way that tr cities have been built to facilitate car traffic. Um, and it's interesting the way that they are now looking back at this planning idea that especially in the 60s and the 70s resulted in a lot of highways, parking spaces, um, in general resulted in the car as a technology occupying a huge amount of the spaces in the city. Um, so then the question becomes, yeah, but okay, we have now um, planned cities in a way with all this transport. We have planned uh, economies, um, work life, we have planned family life, um, so many things we plan based on this technology. This is also why it is not strange that when we talk about uh, automation uh, or talking about future mobilities, it is basically the picture we create the future in. The problem with automation is just that as long as we talk automation as an individually old uh, transport mode, it's not going to solve uh, a lot of problems. Um, it could be that it can solve some of the environmental problems if it's an EV, but this also means that we have to make sure that the energy that battery is loaded from is also made on renewable energies or we're just going to move the um, pollution somewhere else. And this is not even to begin to talk about the production of these cars um, and the um, facilities to service these cars, uh, all this new infrastructure that we have to build in order to actually have that system in place. So if we keep that out of the uh, environmental uh, calculation, uh, it could be that if we are friendly, we say that it can solve some of the environmental problems. One thing that it is most likely not solving is the space problem. Um, and especially not if it's individually owned, um, because I had a colleague that I was at a conference with and he had this very good um, example of how the individually owned um, automated car would create a lot of chaos. Um, because as he said, we were 150 people in the room. Uh, it was at a location in the middle of Copenhagen. And as he said, if we all had our own individual cars that were supposed to come and pick us up when the conference was over, that would mean at five o'clock, that would mean 150 cars that had to come pick a lot of people up at five o'clock. We could then ask people that some had to be picked up at five, some had to be picked up at five past five just in order to make it work. But that was not the big problem. The big problem was basically that these cars don't have any sense of time. So if they are told to be in a specific place at a specific time, the only thing that interests them is to be there on time because that's what they're programmed to do. So that means they could easily be cruising the city for half an hour or more in order to be there at the right time because um, you never know how much traffic there's going to be. And I thought that was actually a quite interesting perspective on some of these things automation also is because it doesn't necessarily include a, a time perspective. But current patterns of transportation with their dominant pattern of energy use are not sustainable and on present trends may compound the environmental problems the world is facing. This is from the United Nations 1997 uh, document in paragraph 47. It's um, just to show you that this is absolutely not a new discussion. It has been going on for so many years uh, that we have uh, an issue with the problem from car driving. Um, one of the things that's been suggested is in that the way to actually think about how can we make sustainable uh, transport is an uh, approach towards a multi-criteria analysis that has four major areas. That's new technologies, alternative fuels, intelligent transport systems, demand management, uh, land use development, planning, and what they call soft measures. Soft measures is not uh, a word I'm going to use because I think this is very misleading to call it soft measures. 
we can call it um, communication measures, we can call it a lot of different things, but there's nothing soft about it uh, based on the research I've done. This is just as hard facts as what we normally call hard facts uh, numbers, for instance. Um, but basically what I'm mostly interested in in this uh, talk is the, the planning, the land use development, and also how to actually think about um, making strategies for communicating or planning um, different ways of using the urban and being mobile. One of the things that I really liked in John Erie's book from 2007 on mobilities is this quote where he says, there's too much transport in the study of travel and not enough society and thinking through the complex intersecting relations between society and transport. Uh, I think it's a very precise quote uh, on what has been the challenges uh, with transport research so far um, because they are keeping in their isolated silos uh, and instead of trying to integrate some of these things that are actually part of making mobilities. This is also very clear when you have an everyday life perspective because you can always get um, the rational things up there. You can always talk about time and efficiency, but when you actually do qualitative research and you start talking to people, you quickly learn how much more there is actually in the, the travel, in the movement, in the mobilities. It's not just about rational factors. In that sense, you could say what mobility is doing, it's not only about thinking about getting from A to B, it's also thinking about how you get from A to B, but it's also even more importantly thinking about why is it that you want to leave? What is it that is uh, in the place you are? What are the emotional caretaking, um, intellectual uh, reasons to why you think this movement or this travel is necessary? And what is on the other side when you get there? Because it's not only about getting from your home to the university. Let's just take that as an example. Um, it's not getting to the front door of the university that's interesting. It's getting to the meeting, getting to the lecture, getting to just sit there and work, getting to the library at the university. It is what goes on after you arrive at the point. And this has a huge influence on how you're moving as well. And also, very importantly, what's actually going on in mobilities, the in-betweens, uh, the spaces that a lot of people get from uh, this being on the move. Uh, I would say it is from all the interviews I ever did on car driving, on biking, on public transport use, everybody. And I am serious. I talk about everybody always when you started asking into it, had actually very qualitative, importantly, um, stories about what they used that space and mobilities for. For a lot of people, it was actually the only time they had on their own uh, without being having to relate to kids or parents or partners or um, all sorts of things that are interfering in our life, not always interfering. A lot of the time it's also a good thing, but all these things we have in our life, then mobility actually came the space they had on their own. So with mobilities, by looking at mobilities, we can better understand the social premises for transport. We can see people's projects and plans today and in the future. Um, and getting that understanding of what mobilities actually mean and what is important, um, is also what we need in order to think about how to plan the future and what kind of future we want. One of the things that um, is an entry point into this communication thing that I talked about um, is to use the concept of storytelling. Stories has a fundamental persuasive character when it comes to making decisions on the future of cities. Um, and articulation and storytelling enhances what Hayek calls ontological expansion, which is the transformative capacity of planners to create things that don't exist. Storytelling is a way of being, being aware of a lot of other perspectives than the one we necessarily see on, us, on ourselves. There is nothing 
knew about storytelling. Storytelling has always been there. Uh, it was maybe called myth um, earlier, but telling a story about the future or about the past or about how things could be is something that's always been going on. What um, is interesting about this is it's part of uh, the argumentative turn in planning where there was a realization of what role it actually plays in planning projects and how important it is for, for, for planning futures. Um, but storytelling also goes on in politics. And uh, here I have um, some quotes from a former Danish minister who was very, very happy about the car and was very interested in getting more bridges built and getting more tunnels built. And he had arguments like this. We become freer and richer with the car. Uh, it's a barrier for growth, no doubt, about, no doubt about that. I don't think we can find one economist that disagrees with the fact that if we take away the toll on the bridge, we will become a richer society. Or this one, if you put taxes on mobility and on moving stuff around, then we get a poorer society. That's simply not up for discussion. So this whole strong story about the, the direct relation between uh, transport, the car, and um, again, growth uh, is a very strong story uh, that lies behind a lot of the reasons why um, so much money is put into actually facilitating this technology. Uh, but we also use storytelling and planning. And then I took a different example, not for everything to be about the car, because one of the things Copenhagen is also known for is the great amount of people biking. It's uh, around 60% that bikes to work and education on a daily basis. And Copenhageners are also, they also own cars and they also use public transport. So they're not one or the other, but most Copenhageners are more or less all of the use all the different modes of mobilities. But this is basically part of a um, pamphlet that was sent out uh, internationally. So it was part of the story that Copenhagen wanted to tell the world around them. But it also was a big part of the story that Copenhagen wanted to tell the Copenhageners to get more of them on the bike. In Copenhagen, we don't have cyclists. We merely have people transporting themselves by bike. So it was a way of not defining people into a specific group because they were biking. It was a way of telling a story that is about how do you get around in uh, the most efficient and um, easy way. It's just easier uh, by bike if you want to transport yourself like that. So these kind of stories is going on in all different kind of things. And now I want to show an example of... Um, of how uh, streets in Copenhagen was actually redone um, where the cars, the, 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 the white the car had to specific amount of space was actually changed. Um, it's called Amble Streets. It's not a really good translation, um, but it's very difficult to find one that's better. The Danish word is Stoika, and that actually means the first part of the word Stoi means a shopping street, and the last part of the street means a street. So the direct translation would be a shopping street street, which sounds really stupid, um, but the whole meaning behind it is basically to slow down pace and have a different um, speed level, a uh, different um, mood on the street. So that was the whole idea. Um, this was an idea that was based on the challenges Copenhagen municipality had in terms of mobility and city space, especially car ownership was, and it is still increasing. So they took one of these neighborhood streets in Copenhagen and they made a traffic experiment. Um, and it's interesting that they chose to make an experiment instead of making a permanent solution. Uh, a lot of the explanation is um, in the fact that these were the three major points that was, um, that was put in as the guidelines for how to make these streets. The urban space must be beautified and urban life strengthened. 
cyclist condition must be improved on stressed routes and public transport needs to be strengthened by allowing for shorter travel time and increased regularity for the buses. These were the three major points that had to go on in these streets. One of the big things that was behind this experiment that was made was also that the public transport provider in Copenhagen made this report where they showed that the bus that was going through this street near Bokal, which is the first one I'm going to tell you about, um, actually had a lot of problems with um, regularity. Uh, that bus is the busiest bus route in Copenhagen. Uh, it was at that time and it still is, so it was the one transporting most people. Uh, so that was one of the economic arguments for actually trying to do something. So the city decided to do a traffic trial. Um, it was um, in different phases. Um, but what it's not difficult to kind of figure out is that if you have these three things that you have to do, it means that somebody has to let go of some space. And that was the car. It was a way of giving... Uh, less space to the car on the street. Um, and this is, of course, why it was a traffic experiment, because this would never have been possible to get through the, the, um, the political system in Copenhagen, um, because they are also, even if there's a lot of wishes for something else, happy about the car. Um, but after this traffic trial, uh, it actually was such a success what this having less streets in the car actually did to the city. So it became a permanent solution. Uh, so this is the first street, Nuabruka. The top picture you see is actually from the beginning, the, from inner city out to Nuabruka, and there was a bridge over some lakes we have in Copenhagen. And on the first picture, you can see how they are actually fighting for the space with the cars. There are cyclists on the sidewalk. Um, Pedestrian fight for space on narrow sidewalks under a high, no, high noise level, making it difficult to talk together. The over 10,000 cyclists ride dangerously slow, close to crowded psychopath, and for cars, Nørrebro is a maze many preferably avoid. This is from a pre-investigation that Gail's architect made um, to actually start out this traffic experiment. Um, and what they did when they made the experiment, it was that they didn't redo anything. They painted red dots on the streets and they painted broader bike lanes. So it was basically a way of using paintings and signs and not permanent uh, installations in the cityscape to show now there is a different meaning on this space. Now it had different rights are being distributed on this space. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting was actually that it took a while for the cyclists to realize that they could actually use uh, the what was previously for cars. So in the beginning, even if there was all this paint, um, all the cyclists were still crowded on the bike path. So it took them a while to realize they could actually move out to the street as well. What you see on the last picture in the bottom is how uh, it actually came to look after the reconstruction, because after it became a permanent thing, they reconstructed uh, the urban scape. Um, what you see here is a bike path that has three people biking next to each other there, and there was still space. And then you see a bus island. Uh, a bus island means that people, um, when they get off the bus, has to wait until there's a clear passage before they can cross the, um, the bike path, which of course gives, makes biking much more efficient um, and it makes it much nicer because you don't constantly have to stop and it also safer for both the cyclist and the, um, the bus passengers. But one of the things I got from one of my bus or cycle interviews that I want to show you here is a quote where a guy said, one of the really cool things on our book, it's really, really cool that you feel you are a priority and privileged and that people have considered you, that there's room for you. There are many places where the bike path is as wide as the road. It's a real priority. I think this is an interesting uh, example of how much it actually means also for the way we move around in the city, the feeling we have of which kind of mobilities are prioritized. Um, it is not strange that the car, so many people are using the car when it's also 
the one who has the most place, the most dominant technology we have, it makes sense that this is how people think they should actually move around. Uh, but in this case, um, this actually showed that it's a different priority, also give different um, meanings to the cycling, and it uh, the cycling increased even more uh, on this street after it was done. Um, one of the things at Nørrebroke that I should say before I go to the next street that was uh, also part of it um, is that, of course, there were problems. Of course, there were people who were not unhappy or not happy about the idea. They were unhappy about the idea. Um, and especially the business association uh, was really unhappy. They were having a campaign in the media um, where they said it was, was uh, harassment against uh, business owners. Uh, and car drivers um, so because they were afraid that they were gonna lose a lot of revenue um, from and not having cars on the street anymore the interesting thing about that is that is absolutely not a new discussion it was exactly the same discussion that went on um, when Copenhagen made the inner city pedestrian zone um, and that was basically in many ways word by word the same discussions that came up um, so what is interesting after because of the success of Nabucco it actually became a permanent solution or it became a planning concept in Copenhagen municipality um, actually I should show you one more thing here that I forgot to tell you because this is also part of the story is the top picture which is with all the cars and the bikes is called Queen Louise's Bridge. And what happened after they read it, uh, the street was that this actually became the second most used public space in Copenhagen. And next after Newham, with New Harbor, which is uh, an old harbor with old houses. It's a business area or um, tourist area uh, with a lot of restaurants and pubs. And actually because of this, uh, reducing of car traffic, suddenly that space in the city became the next most used public space. That was like a surprise for the Copenhagen municipality. They hadn't seen that one coming. Um, but then it became a permanent solution and in 2008, Amabokel, which is another neighborhood street in uh, Copenhagen, um, it probably would have been smart if I had a map of Copenhagen here, but I don't. I forgot to think about that. But basically, Copenhagen is like the palm of your hand. There is an inner city in the middle, and then we have these different neighborhood districts going out. Um, and this is another one of them. But what they did, there is a lot of stories I can tell you about this process. Um, it went much easier with fewer conflicts. People had seen what it was they got in the other neighborhood street. So they kind of understood what it was that they were actually getting offered with this um, new type of street, especially this these um, spaces, this urban spaces that suddenly opened up for cafes to serve food and for people to hang out uh, was really important. But what Copenhagen municipality did because they were really clever and they thought we don't want to have the same discussion from the business association again, is they made uh, some research on who it is that actually, who is actually shopping and how they're shopping. Uh, this research is also in other places around the world. This is the first that's done in Denmark. Um, sometimes um, countries have this idea that their context is entirely different from everybody else's, so they need to have an investigation that is made in their own context, in their own country. Um, so the Copenhagen municipality did that, and they used that as part of the storytelling and the promotion material for the um, making the next Amble Street in Copenhagen. We're giving 40 millions to start the work to create an attractive Amble Street. We give the stores and the consumers better conditions by giving more space to pedestrians, cyclists, and users of public transport, which constitutes 80% of shoppers in Copenhagen. So as part of the communication strategy, there was a storytelling um, about that it's bikers are actually really good shoppers because they can just throw their bike and then go into the shop. They don't have to find a parking space. So by starting to look into these um, stories that has for so many years been taking up so much space about how 
car was what created growth and created business, they basically made an investigation that showed the entirely uh, opposite thing. So this is just two examples of how storytelling was used um, to, um, to actually create solutions in Copenhagen where uh, movement and mobility became more sustainable because there were more of it that was by public transport and by biking and by walking. Um, the last example is also a neighborhood street. And the reason why I'm going to show you that is also to put emphasis on the importance of actually involving people in what kind of streetscapes you should have, what you should actually be able to do uh, where you live. Um, this is called Nord of It's a, a third neighborhood in Copenhagen. Uh, the top picture is basically a picture of the street. Uh, it has uh, a lot of businesses. It has cars. It has bikers. It has buses. It has a school. So it's basically a street with too much stuff on um, and not enough space. The outset was a citizen involvement project called Put Words on the Street. What does this street mean to you? Uh, two maps were made, a map, what do you want to keep and what do you want to change? They had two months where they invited people in. They also made a lot of events to ask them, what do you actually think we should have on this street? What is important? Um, and what was interesting was that if you, you can't see what the red dots on the below picture are at, but a lot of it is on also on cars and parking. So they wanted to keep cars and parking and all the possibilities for cars there already were and then they also wanted uh, urban areas so they wanted street um, street life they wanted that the businesses could sell things on the street they wanted more um, parking for bikes they wanted more safe uh, bike traffic and basically because of this citizen process where they were asked what they wanted they also realize that we can't have all this because there's simply not enough space. So with this space available, we have to make choices. Uh, and what are the choices that we want to do? And um, what it actually ended up with, the final conclusion was to make a cycle street, allowing for car traffic at 20 kilometers per hour. Cycle traffic comes first, a flexible use of city space so that the same spaces are used for car parking, cycle parking, and commerce on different hours and different days. So instead of using the Amble Street uh, suggestion, they actually went a step further and said, we want a cycle street instead. Because in order to get all the other stuff they also wanted from the city, all the, the city life, the human scale, um, where it's a different city to be in, they actually decided that it means that we have to give up all that space we use on cars because we can't have the other things. So this is another interesting example of, yes, the car means a lot to people and it is extremely important because a lot of people, this is how they get their everyday life to work. So when you ask people to stop using the car, you're basically asking them to reorganize their everyday life. But when there is something that they can see they get instead. So if it's just about not getting using the car anymore, we are in a different time now where the climate crisis have made some things more okay to talk about the environment. But in general, it's something that's so far away. So the everyday uh, solution of problems is just more present. So no, we don't want to give up our car because it means we have to reorganize the everyday life. But if we instead ask the question, do you want to have this kind of city space where your kids can transport yourself and you can actually hang out on the street and there is different opportunities in this city space, then there is a bigger chance that people actually say, yeah, that's actually a good idea. And how much do I actually need that car? And I'm actually living in a place where there's a lot of other opportunities for mobilities. So this is a very good example on, on this process of storytelling and this process of of not just thinking about taking something away, but also thinking about what is it that you get instead. In this way, it's also a very important part of being part of creating their own futures. What is the future that we want to have uh, in this city? How should it look like? Um, this uh, is what you could relate to what is called tactical urbanism. Tactical urbanism is uh, short-term action for long-term change. Uh, and the idea is to provide test scenarios, traffic experiments that can inform long-term implementations. 
So an important part is also to promote citizens' engagement and create ownership to the project. Uh, the pictures you can see on the side are from different projects around the world, um, but basically a lot of it is claiming parking spaces or claiming some road space to actually make these spaces that are dominating our city with their great landscape into lift spaces. It's the human scale of what the city should be. This is also possible because the renewed love affair with the city, mostly within the demographics of the millennials, um, who moves back in cities that promotes walking, cycling and public transportation, while at the same time are focusing on cultural, commercial and recreational opportunities. Um, I would say we have one of the big challenges we have right now. And I think this is very true when we talk about uh, smart cities and when we talk about automation is that we have a generation mostly in power of these systems how it should be plan planned what political decisions should be made that are a different generation than the ones who are actually going to use it um, because we are having uh, the millennials are grown up in a time where sharing is a totally different there's a totally different outset it's taking much more for granted the need to own uh, is not uh, as important as the need to have access. Um, and I think this is basically also what technical urbanism is talking into. It's talking into this thing that, that what can we do with all this space and the kind of life we have and the kind of way we meet people and the social interactions with people if we actually start uh, thinking about the spaces in the city in a different way. So let's go back to the story of the smart cities because they are often considered as coded spaces facilitating self-learning, social technical environments grounded in IT and artificial intelligence, where software is applied to facilitate the efficient use of resources, space, infrastructure, and energy, and to provide user friendliness and sustainability. So this is basically the idea by making this system that means that um, it, the, the cars can drive closer so people don't have to uh, stand in, there's no congestion because it's much more efficient the way it's working. Um, and uh, the way the, um, the landscape around us is working is that we constantly get informed about a lot of things so we can act more rationally and we can learn how to act in the most efficient way. Um, it's always very important to say, of course, we have a lot of smart in the city already. We also have automation in many cities. In Copenhagen, for instance, we have a um, metro system that is automated. Um, we have um, the way the intelligent traffic systems are working is also a part of the smart city. The, um, the way the the trains are operated, the way the tracks are changing, the way the traffic lights are changing um, during the day, how long they're red, how long they're green. Um, all these things are part of the smart city. So it's already there. The question is in order to, can this actually create a more sustainable future or is it a different way we need to think? Uh, another way of thinking about smart cities is also as assemblages of technologies aimed at increasing competitiveness, administrative efficiency, and social inclusion. Um, the social inclusion comes from the idea that all people get a different kind of mobility because they suddenly don't need to be able to drive themselves or uh, handicapped people or people with different kind of disabilities um, have an access to come to move in a different way because of automation and smart cities. But at the same time, when we look at the story of the lived city, the human scale city, uh, we see totally different uh, pictures. What is interesting about the pictures I'm showing you here is they're all from renewal projects, um, new urban projects in Copenhagen. Um, what you see here is urban life. What you see is a uh, bike path. What you see is water. Uh, there is 
it's very difficult to find pictures with cars on. The one in the top where you can see a bus and two cars, which are actually taxis, is uh, by the station in, in one of these urban areas. The thing about at the top, the three top pictures is from one urban area where there are actually 30,000 new housing um, units. And they have uh, a lot of cars. Um, not as many as the people who were constructing it actually thought it turned out that less people are actually interested in having a car when they live there, which makes a lot of sense because there's a metro, there's a bus, there's a hover bus, and there are bike paths. So it's actually quite easy to get around when you live there. Um, but what is the interesting, what I want to show with these pictures is the story that architects uh, are told to sell to politicians and planners and the people are these stories of lived urban space. Um, it's not about efficiency. It's not about uh, things moving fast. It's basically about dwellings. It's about meetings. It's about social interaction. Um, and this is also what is at stake when we talk about international city competition, the most livable cities in the world, which is a really strong driver for um, many cities around the world. Um, it's also a strong driver for who can attract uh, companies uh, with um, mostly companies with people not doing production things, but more, um, I can't remember that word, but people working in medical businesses and computer businesses and stuff like that. So what is we have here is actually a quite interesting um, dichotomy between the idea of the, the smart autonomous city and the livable city and the international city competition, it's two quite different futures we're viewing here. It's two quite different futures we're seeing. Um, so what is a smart city? Well, there is definitely a dichotomy between big tech solutions and a world of bottom-up planning. Um, and what we need to rethink is the concept of smart cities in a wider sociopolitical perspective and infuse its discourse with an understanding of all the things cities are and not only which technologies we can put into them. Uh, because good urban lives or the human city is not only about the technologies, it's also about uh, how we use the technologies and how we use the city. So what Martin Heyer says is what we need is smart urbanism rather than smart cities. So when we are imagining future cities, it's always a product of ethics. It's an idea of how the world could and should be. Um, it's not a, a clean, rational idea of what is the most efficient. It is basically an idea of what kind of life we want to live, how we think the future should look like. Um, and leaning back and thinking about what is actually important in life. Um, it's not always efficiency and it's not always speed, but there's actually also a lot of things that makes cities um, important or good places to stay and live. And what is very important is that emotions are not merely an irrelevant accompaniment to what we're doing, like moussak in a supermarket but a kind of bodily commentaries on how we and our concerns are firing. What is it that actually matters to people? So basically what I want to end out with is saying so that we need to think about why and for what, what are we doing this for? What is, what kind of future are we imagining? What is it that we want? Um, there will be people who would say that this is coming and we can't decide whether or not it's coming. Um, and there is, of course, the thing about artificial intelligence, um, which could mean that there might be things we're not going to decide on our own. But so far, I would say, luckily, it's not here yet. Uh, so that means that we are also part of planning how this future should look um, and what kind of escapes we want to live in. And right now I see that there are three things that is actually quite important. There is the increased focus on climate change. There are some of these car companies, new business, business models that are uh, focusing on the combination of autonomous connected electric and shared mobilities, which means that it's not about individually owned ownership anymore. And then there is this economic competitiveness in livable cities. 
So maybe the future is not about um, rolling out this technological system. Maybe the future is just about as much about looking at how can we actually take the low hanging fruit um, and redistribute the way uh, mobility is going on in cities because um, one of the things we know is that 30% of all car trips in Europe, to take that as an example, is less than three kilometers and 50% of all car trips are less than five kilometers. And these um, trips are all trips that could be replaced by walking, cycling or uh, public transport. Um, so networked urban mobilities, what does that mean? Yeah, maybe we need to stop thinking about efficiency and instead thinking about sufficiency if we want to have a sustainable transport system in the future. Um, maybe it's we need to think about having enough. Uh, there is, in Copenhagen, a lot of cars. That's a totally different discussion, but I'm just going to come up with it anyways. In Copenhagen, a lot of people own cars and more and more people buy cars and they have them on the parking lot because it's... Uh, it's a potential of mobility that they like when they go to the summer cottage in the weekend. Um, and because we are creating cities in a way where the car is in center, we actually have the right to have a car standing on a parking space, uh, taking up a lot of space uh, so we can use it whenever we want, however we want. These are actually things we could start discussing if, if this is actually how we want to use the spaces in our cities. Networked urban mobilities, transport information and communication infrastructures are essential parts of everyday life. And they are shaping identities and they are shaping people's emotional repertoire through which individuals encounter, define and respond to others and the world. So all the different kinds of mobilities that are part of our everyday life are part of deciding who we are and how we live our lives. Um, and the technologies of today, they pre-structure the social opportunity spaces of tomorrow and the way how people live, work and interact in the future. So in order to actually create um, different futures that are not moving in the same path dependent order logic that we have today, we have to think out of the box and maybe think the way we implement and give significance to the technologies of today pre-structure the social opportunity spaces of tomorrow. So we need to think about what kind of smart city do we want? Um, what is sustainable mobility? Um, and in the broad perspective, and never forget about the human lives that should be uh, in the center of how urban futures should look. Thank you very much. Thank you.